Welcome to the School of Unlearning. I'm your host, Elisa Haggerty. I've always believed in the power of questions. They create a gap, a space where we pause and begin to challenge the world around us. Without questions, we're stuck in the trance of life, a life given to us versus one created with agency. Your journey to rethink and unlearn the norms no longer serving you begins now. Hey, everybody. Welcome back to the School of Unlearning podcast. Thanks for staying with me. Today's episode seven, and we're sitting down with Kate Fagan, who's an Emmy award winning journalist and the author of the number one New York Times bestselling book, What Made Maddie Run, which was long listed for the Penn ESPN award. She's currently working for Meadowlark Media and writes for Sports Illustrated and previously spent seven years as a columnist and feature writer for ESPNW, ESPN.com, ESPN the magazine and she currently lives in Charleston South Carolina with her wife Catherine and their two dogs we talk a little bit today around the first book what made Maddie run and then also her most recent publication all the colors came out which is sort of a a love letter and a tribute to her relationship with her father who passed away with ALS I highly recommend the book itself um it's a, it's a force of, of nature, and it will certainly connect you to your humanity. So in our session today, we talk quite a bit about uh, various things. The first thing is her superpower. What's Kate's superpower growing up? And also as an adult, what gets her to sort of shine and navigate the world around her? We also talk a lot about quitting, quitting in sports and the stigma that comes with it, how men get to take breaks, and women are often seen and portrayed as people who quit. Uh, we also talk a lot about relationships in sports and the nuance that comes with, uh, the delicate balance between a coach and a player. And then lastly, we talk a lot about what Kate is actively unlearning and how she views unlearning holistically. I think you're going to really love this podcast. It's uh, super personable. It's real. It's honest. And yeah, we talk about sports a lot because that's a big uh, thing that showed up for both of us in our lives and still does. So I hope you enjoy and uh, share with friends who you think would benefit. All right. Welcome, Kate, to the School of Unlearning podcast. How are you doing today? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course. I actually like your headphones. They're pretty dope. I feel like I got to up-level my podcast game to to be on your level. Yeah. I mean, I, it's mostly a thing I have with the in-ear. Um, like, I, I, I do this other show with Dan Lebatard, and they once asked me a question about whether and, – and now I'm feeling like an asshole saying this – but uh, he was like, douche or no douche, AirPods. And they're Mm. not. Everyone wears them now. Like, I see them everywhere. I actually need a pair. But it's in my head that I I can't wear them and and look okay. So now I'm feeling like I'm offending you. But yes, that's why I have these over-the-ear headphones. (laughs) Nah, no offense taken. I love it. Um, So I've been a huge fan of your work for a couple years now. Um, I remember I read... Well, well, actually, your second book, What Made made, uh, Maddie Run, when I was flying to Asia, I read it like in one one plane ride, which I guess isn't that crazy because it's a 14 hour trip. (laughs) However, um, with my ADD, I was like proud of myself that I like was able to get through that. So, but that book was really important for me, like, especially as a former athlete, I now dabble in things, uh, whenever my body allows me to, but just to see the conversation about mental health be so broken open and also to be examined. I mean, I think, you know, we're finally getting to this place where mental health is like, has a platform and has some, street cred, which sounds weird to say, maybe that's not the right word, but people are talking about it and with intention. Um, so thank you for writing that book. I'm curious, um, how the book still comes up for you in like your, your day to day, whether that be like conversations or just like people are still reading it, or is it still shaping the way that you see women are just kind of like conditioned to just run and gun through hard things and and not take breaks? That book actually, I still, it's just been so widely read and by, I think by a lot of groups of people, but also specifically anyone who was focused on sports at a high level at the high school, college level or beyond. I think a lot of people within those communities read the book. And I think that when, you know, Maddie, the Madison Holleran, who the book is about at this point, I think she, she died seven years ago, six, six, seven years ago. So it's been a a lot of time. And I think that the conversation around mental health in sports has gotten so much more open as you, as you mentioned, but it's also shifting because I think when I read, when I wrote the book, people wanted to have the conversation about actually just acknowledging that athletes outside of their sport could be dealing with things that impact them Mm -hmm. and their performance. 
And it was that that was a conversation that a lot of people wanted to have. And then I think even this past Olympics with Simone Biles, you saw mm-hmm. the conversation take its next evolution, which is, mm-hmm. well, what if whether it's mental health or outside pressures or it, your internal processing of yourself in the game, what if it's how do we deal when it actually impacts whether or not you're going to participate? Because before mm-hmm. it was trying to mitigate the effects of it so that you could be your best self. And it was like, well, what if, True. what if your best self is not possible in that moment? So I've seen right. the conversation evolve and evolve, but I don't think, uh, I don't think a week goes by where somebody doesn't reach out and want to talk about Maddie's story and, and the impact uh, of that discussion on their life. And then similarly, I think about it all the time, not, not necessarily yeah. Maddie, but I'm in a constant flux with how, you know, like I, I, I'll delete Instagram every third month Same. just because I'm like in a constant, yeah, I'm in a constant yeah. flux of like, ah, I got to get back to myself and I got to get back to, mm. you know, being present in the world. And, and that is very much driven by Maddie's story. Yeah, for sure. Um, I do want to, I have a couple questions around social media, particularly just how it all gets handled. I think, uh, we'll get into that a little bit later. Um, I do want to go back to a little bit of your book, which, um, again, I love, I've been talking to all my friends, non hoopers and hoopers alike about all the colors came out. Um, we share a lot of similar like pathways in life. Um, my dad is also, uh, for about 11 years has had like late stage or, uh, a sort of late stage dementia. Um, in the past couple of years, it's gotten pretty bad. So when I read your book, I not only cried, but I was also like, okay, <laughs> I need to talk to this woman because we have so many similar pathways again and how we've grown up as athletes with, with parents who help shape us in many really cool ways. Um, but the book is, is, is a beautiful tribute to him. It's also a tribute to your relationship with him and to the sport. Um, and you do talk a little bit about your childhood in that book. You, you dabble in a few chapters about life growing up and and being an athlete and always having a pair of sneakers in the back of the the, the trunk ready to go. And But I, I actually want to talk a little bit about something. I'm not sure you mentioned explicitly in the book, but I'm curious if if when you were growing up, when you were trying to be successful with basketball and you were successful, did you feel like you had um, you were too in your head, like you were too you cared too much and you didn't know how to get to flow state? Do you feel like that like was something that you recognized in the time or only now looking back, you can see that you you weren't able always to get into flow state. And I don't even know. I never saw you play. Maybe you were in flow state, but um, just curious how you felt about that. Yeah, I think about it was probably about six or seven years ago. While I was at ESPN, I was doing a profile on Abby Wambach and we had this long conversation about the header from Mm -hmm. Megan Rapinoe that she converted in it must have been 2011 in in the quarterfinals against Brazil. I don't know if you remember the moment. It's kind of a pretty yeah, iconic yeah. women's there, sports yeah. moment. <laughs> and we had this long conversation about how leading up to that moment on the in the in the that particular game and also Abby as a whole she was saying that in that game she wasn't thinking oh, if we lose this game, it will be the earliest exit for the U.S. women's national team. And this game is on ESPN and probably being watched by millions of people. And in addition, if if for that particular team, if they bow out early of a tournament, it's not just about soccer. It's about equality. It's about mm-hmm. misogyny in sports. Like It's about all of these things. Abby, in that moment, was not has has no meta level of awareness Mm. and I think that and that was eye-opening for me because it was the first time that I'd had a conversation with an athlete who very more easily would get into flow state and not have layers upon layers upon layers of awareness Mm. I was not like that as an athlete I was it was less about it was more for me and maybe this is what makes me a writer is I just I'm always like stacking layers of awareness on layers of awareness. Yeah. And that's not great for an athlete. Mm -hmm. Like the the layers of awareness that I would have playing basketball from like, and you know, you know this too, like which college coaches were at my AAU tournament. Right. Right. And we're sitting there and what that might mean for me. And then also like adding my stats up in my head as I'm playing 
Mm-hmm. And then on top of it, just like looking at the meta view of how that would impact me, I, I could never turn that off. Right. So, uh, but pickup, I could always turn it off and pickup. I love yeah. pickup because pickup, pickup was a flow state, but a game, it just, I couldn't get out of that meta awareness. And I, and I think that did impact me, but I didn't have any tools at the time because I, I stopped playing college basketball, the 2003, 2004 season. I mean, we were right. still doing static stretching then, yeah. you know, there weren't, there I wasn't all a lot those of things. Yep. Yeah. There wasn't, I see, I see everyone now like doing, Oh, dynamic stretching. That makes sense. But like, mm-hmm. there just was no, no one was talking to me about like my in game state. So I had no tools to make that better. Yeah. Mindset's a huge thing. Um, I remember doing some crazy work as that had absolutely nothing to do with basketball. They weren't even remotely trans transferable and they were like, run a 5k. I'm like, why? <laughs> like, um, we, we but, run a 5k as our timed event every year in college. Yeah. Like that, you know, yeah. some people come back, they got to run a mile. Yeah. We did a 5k. Yeah. Absolutely why? insane. Um, <laughs> yes. Yeah, I don't know. Sometimes I wish I could go back and, and try to play again. I know that's maybe a mood point, but I, I kind of fantasize like, how could I? Because I, I play still in Brooklyn here. We play with a bunch of women. We have good runs and it's competitive and, you know, it's just really fun. And I feel like I'm like a better player now at 37 than I ever was in college, even though I'm not nearly as like quick and, you know, agile mm-hmm. and stuff. But um, so if you could go back in time to your high school or college self and give you one of the tools you have now, what would that be? It would be, it would definitely be more of a mental tool than anything. Although mm-hmm. I, well, to your point that you just made about playing now, I, I just got back from Mohegan sun and I was at the aces sun game mm-hmm. and I try to be kind to myself when I think about how much better this generation of players is than our generation. And I imagine our generation of players there was women who played in the 70s and and my dad felt that way too when he would watch the NBA games right he was he he always he just was like oh I I couldn't compete with them because strength training wasn't a thing really in the 70s yeah so I try to be kind about like the evolutions that we didn't you just don't know what you don't know Mm -hmm. and but for me definitely the one thing I, I that I think could have helped me the most was if our team had had someone on staff who was, a, and I was open to it because that would have been a huge hurdle too about the mental aspect of the game and how to lose perspective sometimes. Cause I felt like I always had too much perspective um, about mm-hmm. everything. Mm-hmm. So I think that would have helped me a lot because I think it, it definitely was a detriment that I was, I just was so inside my head nonstop. Yeah. I think a lot about that too, actually relating to social media a little bit and and business. I want to get into, you know, obviously you leaving ESPN and and what that brought out for you, like in terms of external validation, but like, you know, as an athlete growing up, I, of course I love the game. I love all the games that I played, but it was very much about external validation, like approval and seeking control or maybe a security of a scholarship, whatever it, it may be. And, um, I didn't really know that at the time, but as I, as I'm now playing or playing random sports, it's like, it's playing truly for the love movement and friends and community. And that really unlocks a different level of flow state. Whereas before it was just like external validation and like, yeah, I like the game. I love the game, but Mm -hmm. it was so external. And I just, you know, I I don't know what skill I would give myself because I don't know that I would have been able to actually get through to me at 14, 15. I was still such a, you know, I cared cared too much. And so sometimes you just can't know. Um, I'm curious as you were growing up or looking back on your childhood now, whether it be athletics or non-athletics, um, do you feel like you had a superpower growing up? Ooh, I definitely didn't think I had a superpower growing up while I was growing up. Uh, I always, I was, um, I was like a super chubby little kid, um, Hmm. until seventh grade and I have never lost that mindset. So mm-hmm. I always, I'm always like a, a chubby 10 year old in my head. Always. Interesting. Yeah. Um, so I definitely, <laughs> I definitely didn't think I had one. Um, and I don't know. I mean, it's, that's a, that's a really tough question because I think when you're a kid, your sample size is so low with everything that you're doing (laughs) that Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. everything feels like the most important thing that would ever happen. Um, cause it's the first time it's ever happened and you have no sample size about how 
what a speck of like, you know, a moment it could be in the future. Um, okay. To buy myself more time. What would, what, what was your superpower <laughs> as a kid? Well, I don't think I knew it at the time. Right. But I would say looking back, my yeah. superpower was, was reading emotions and reading people. Um, that's kind of how I, I got through. I had like mm -hmm. seven brothers and sisters and there was just a lot of drama. And, um, I found like, I found a sense of like uh, stability and, and, confidence moving and, and reading people's emotions and, and sort of body on the court. And so that, that allowed me to find a place, find a home, but I didn't know it at the time. Right. I think you can only know looking back sometimes, but. Yeah. Um, I mean, I definitely, I have that same, I still have that same skill set about like reading emotion. I, I'm not sure now if it's a superpower or a detriment because I, I constantly feel like I'm in charge of other people's emotions. Like whenever I'm with my mom, mm. I can mm -hmm. sense if she's struggling or in a bad mood and, or, or whatever. And I, I feel responsible for ensuring that it morphs from a bad mood to a good mood. Um, but on, on the court, I do think that whatever awareness level I had about the layers of like, who's watching, how they're watching, how that it could impact me. It also translated to uh, court vision and not just like I could make the right pass. That wasn't always the case, yeah. but I could very much, if I learned to play once I could run it as the center. I could ver like, mm. it was very easy for me to like pull back from like first person vision on the court yeah. to like seeing the court from above and knowing mm -hmm. why people were making the movements or why the play was structured the way it was. Right. So from a very fundamental basketball standpoint, that was always my superpower was like, I very much understood all of the movements yeah. on the court and, and their purpose. Yeah. So you were a shooting guard, right? Or point guard or both? Back when shooting guard was a thing, I was a shooting guard. Yeah. 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 Um, yeah. I mean, it sounds like you had like a 360 perspective when sometimes that, yeah. you know, really helped you and other times might've been harder as you think about, and maybe the superpower is the, maybe not the right term. I think what I'm trying to get at is just like the thing that allowed you to navigate life, the thing that allows you to, to be in your state of flow and like your state of, um, uh, alignment. And so I think about now as an adult and obviously the work you do as a writer and a storyteller, um, and, and much more than that too, an advocate. Um, do you feel like you have a superpower these days that you're aware of oh, and yeah. you try, you're protective of, and you try to really stay in that lane or use it? Um, this might be really broad, but I'll, I'll try to zoom in on it is like, I think that I'm a very good noticer of, not just what's the the thing that I'm best at is noticing what's most interesting. Mm. And this was, and, and at, when I was earlier in my career, I didn't give myself enough credit that the thing that I was noticing as interesting was actually interesting. Cause when you're younger, you're like, well, am I smart mm. enough to actually like, draw out that one thread and present it to people as if it's interesting, you know, cause it's, you have to trust yourself that if you're noticing something interesting, that it's actually interesting and that people will relate to it. Right. Um, so I, I do think that that's my superpower in writing and in communication. Like I, it's always my goal when I like go out to dinner with friends or new people, I, I feel like I've failed if I come home and we only talked about people, mm -hmm. you know, like it, we, we basically just like gossiped about other yeah. people as opposed to ideas. Right. right. Um, and I think that that same, that same power in a conversation where I try to cut through to what's interesting, I think I'm able to do that in writing. And some of that is just trust that, mm what I've, what I've noticed, I'm not the only one because that's all that writing is, is when someone reads something, the best case scenario is that they're like, Oh my God, I felt that too. Or I thought mm. that too. Yeah. Or someone has just 
made an observation about some small societal thing. And like, I've thought that, but no one ever brought it to the surface like that. And I think right. that's, that's something that I've tried to trust more and more as I've gotten older that I, like, I have that capability. Yeah, I would say you do too. And it, I have another point I want to kind of add on to that. But when I think about sports these days, and I, I watch a fair amount of it, it's actually my way of like, because I work in the field of like of, of mental health and, you know, conscious coaching and working with people on like a one on one basis. So there's a lot it's a lot of it's not super light, right? There's a lot of inward dialogue. Mm -hmm. And so I like watch sports because I'm like need to tune out. But it's also, you know, it's never tuning out fully. There's always human stories there. But I get sometimes so bored by what's on SportsCenter and ESPN because I'm like, it's it's just so binary. It's like, who's the best player? who had the most points. And I'm, mm -hmm. I feel for the younger generation, and I know this is not news to you, it's just more conversation, like the younger generation, like no wonder why they're all crazy and think that they have to be like, you know, either Kyrie or LeBron in order to be valid because that's all that's ever talked about. And I just, I don't know, it just hit me this past year. I'm like, this is actually boring. And like, there's so many stories that are just fucking amazing about humans out there in sports, yeah. you highlight them. Thank you. <laughs> but I just want to know, like, how do you feel about that as you are someone who like notices what's really interesting and what's really relevant to the human experience? Like, how do you feel about the state of sports media these days? Yeah. I mean, it was one of the reasons that I left ESPN was because just the it's a much lower hanging, it's, it's a lower hanging fruit to engage people's, I mean, we talk about all the time, like to have a debate or to in, inspire outrage is like a much, it's going to get better ratings than mm. almost all of the time than if you're trying to have a nuanced conversation. And I think to your point about younger players, I think about them all the time. I, I think about them frequently in that the ability to consume the absolute best player at any moment. So if you're a young kid growing up right now, there's a lot of benefit. And I, and I've, and I've talked to some young kids about this. Like you can go on Instagram. And when I was growing up as a girls player in upstate New York, I was reliant on whoever was around me. And thank goodness for me, I had a professional basketball player as a dad, but I was reliant on whatever smart people who thought up drills or ball handling drills to teach me in upstate mm -hmm. New York versus now kids can go on Instagram and like the best player development players who work with Durant and Kyrie are on Instagram showing them the drills that the best players in the world are doing. Mm -hmm. And that is an asset where it's like you, you no longer could just be like, well, I, you know, I was in podunk Minnesota and like, I didn't have good coaching. Of yeah. course, good one-on-one -on -one coaching is still important, but you can still see the drills that other people are doing. But my, my larger point was that when I was growing up, and this isn't like a, it was uphill both ways, different. I, there was yeah. a player who played for the opposing high school team. She was a senior when I was an eighth grader. She went and played at Duke. And I, she'd come and teach summer camps when I was a little kid. And that was my, like, she was in my little village and she was mm -hmm. like the person who was doing the thing that I wanted to do. And it was attainable because she was really good and she was a D one player, but like she would teach me drills and it was like, okay, I want to be her. I wasn't trying to be Diana Taurasi or LeBron fair. James because yeah, I was like, there was a more immediate like model for me. Yeah. Whereas I don't, I feel like that's gotten, obliterated to some extent. Whereas yeah. like now you could, you can be and see anything and it's like, well, shit, how am I ever going to be page Beckers? Or, I mean, right. Yeah. There's just not that <laughs> first step of like achievement. Yeah. Um, Paige is a baller. Also, it, it sounds like also it just lacks. Yes, um, I think these days it's like it just so, sort of lacks like an intimacy and, and like a familiar sense of like, again, achievability, which I think and I think about that too, like the game these days too, with basketball is, um, is more playful. It feels like, it feels like there's just a lot more, like, I don't know, people are more free And back in when I was growing up, it was mm -hmm. just like, you do, you do your layups this way and your left hand layup this way and you don't dare do them funky and you know, like all the things. And I always kind of wish like I had a little bit of exposure to that growing up, but, um, okay. We could probably talk about basketball for like nine years, but I do want to ask you some well questions. Oh, we ahead. should actually stick to that point because I don't know Let's the do people that listen to this podcast okay. whether they care about this, but um, 
I just did a, 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 a an essay on, and you know this trope in women's basketball that it's more fundamental than men's basketball, and mm. that like women they pass better and they have good jump stops, and I think it's a thing that men have always said because they don't want to be mean, and they're like, well, just say that. And I think that the impact that that has had throughout the years is that like women's basketball, especially growing up, like we haven't had a ton of freedom in playing because it was like, well, if the one thing we are is fundamental, how dare you not be fundamental? And I, and I was doing this essay because of Simone Augustus, who's an Olympic gold medalist, Mm -hmm. WNBA all-star because she just retired. And I, a lot of, a lot of players were telling me that she was the first player to come along who wasn't like traditionally fundamental. Like she was willing to put that like hot sauce on everything that she did. Right. And then she also won WNBA titles and Olympic medals. So it kind of really opened the door for women to say, just because you're putting like swag on things doesn't mean you're not working hard and fundamentally sound. Like how those two things. And I think that's probably parallel to a lot of things in life, Mm -hmm. how those things got linked together. That like, if you're, swaggy in any way like you don't work hard like these are all things Mm -hmm. that I don't know where they came from but trying to separate them is necessary because they have one has almost nothing to do with the other yeah I think that does it has a lot of parallels to business too and um the way that women sort of present themselves and write and speak and um that there's a lot of parallels there uh one question about when you were in college uh I think in I think it was your freshman year correct me I think you you wanted to take a break from basketball or quit was it freshman or sophomore year I don't remember freshman. Um, it was my sophomore year, but I was a red shirt freshman. So yeah. Yeah. So you were kind of like at this place of like wanting to step away from the game. You ended up coming back, which you talk about being a valuable thing that you did. You're happy that you did. I'm just curious, what did you kind of most need in that time? What were you missing or what did you need from the game or people that, that you seemingly weren't getting? Mm. It was almost nothing to do with the game and all to do with uh, how I was being coached at that time when I first got to college. And this is something that my wife and I talk a lot about because she is, she teaches yoga and whether it's, you know, yoga, fitness, sports, I think a lot of us fall in love with it because of someone else, because Mm -hmm. we're showing up for someone else or, you know, whether it's like a teammate that you love spending time with or a coach who like teaches you the game in a way that makes you want to show up. Mm -hmm. I think that that fuels so much of our love of, of sports. And when I got to Colorado, my coach for reasons unknown, I think maybe just because I was new, I was from New York and I can be sarcastic. She just thought that I was the person I was the person that she should like pinpoint every mistake I made Mm. and hang every team lesson onto. Mm. So it was like other people could be doing the same thing, but if I missed a box out, then she would stop practice and then she would use me to like teach the lesson. And that was not how I, it was not feasible for me to be that person. And it was making me hate showing up. And and I don't think at that age I could fully decipher whether I hated basketball or I hated how it was making me feel. Yeah. But yeah, that that was the so when we had a, a conversation about it, my coach was was wonderful enough to recognize these things and and change that. And it was almost comical in retrospect, the 180 she did on it and, uh, really the same way she would hang every mistake on it. Yeah. She would start every time I did something good, she would stop and say how that's an example of how everyone else should do things. Um, Jeez. but it was what I, it was what I needed at the time. And she was good about it. She wasn't yeah. like, no one else would have noticed. I don't think, but I was like, Oh wow. She really one eighty would on this. And yeah. she spent practices building me up. And yeah. I, I think that most players want that. Yeah, I think they do actually. Um, and sometimes I, I think a lot about like, there's a lot of, in, in the friends and the people who I talk to, a lot of people love the college game and they don't like the pro game, especially in, in the 
on the men's side um, for lots of various reasons. But the reason I love the college game and the pro game is because I love seeing stories and people uh, become a great player or become who they're meant to be as a player. Like they, they blossom for lack of a better word. And it makes me, it kind of breaks my heart. Cause it, that story kind of illuminates that like, it's so fickle, like a, a relationship that is like you had a love with basketball and it could have gone out the door just because someone, a coach mm-hmm. wasn't seeing you, didn't understand what you needed and was too hung up on showmanship basically to, to really like nurture you the way that you needed to. And I, I just think that like, again, when I think about consumerism, it's like people buy, people don't buy products. They buy, they buy people or the promise of people in community. And with sports, it's like, we play sports. It's a, it's a hoop, it's a ball, but we, we play that because of approval. We play that because of community. So it, um, I'm happy your coach did a 180. Mm-hmm. I'm frustrated that it took uh, almost meltdown and quitting for that to happen. But <laughs> if you're a coach listening, uh, please don't do that. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah. <laughs> it's so wild. Um, I want to talk a little bit about in the book, um, all the colors came out. You, in one of the chapters, uh, I think it was page 133. Um, I like, I'm such a annotator. I don't know if you do this when you read books, but I'm always like writing and annotating all the pages. Um, yeah. You talk a lot about surrender and you came to this point of understanding. I think you were, it was in reference to your dad and, and his, his battle with ALS and, this place of surrender for him that you are exploring and also yours. And it's a really pivotal point. It kind of hits on Simone Biles and your previous book, what made, what made Maddie run that surrender became the sort of place of perseverance, freedom, compassion, and generosity. Um, I'd like to, can you talk a little bit more about this idea of surrender, your, your aha moments then, and what you're sort of actively unlearning about, about surrender and about quitting or stepping away from things. Yeah. Uh, Well, it definitely, that part of all the colors came out, as you mentioned, definitely has its origin in what made Maddie run because after that book came out and I would, I would go around a lot and talk to student athletes or like athletic departments, right? They were like, can you come in and and tell Maddie's story and the lessons Mm -hmm. learned? And I would talk to student athletes afterward, like one-on-one or they'd come up And we would spend a good amount of time talking about this word quit and quitting and how in sports quitting is so loaded, whether you're going to quit a drill or quit a team or quit the sport throughout their childhoods. And I saw it mirrored in mine. There was just no room for quitting to be anything but a disappointment to yourself and everyone. Mm -hmm. And that as I tried to write and all the colors came out, the impact of quitting would be that you are a worse person afterward. Mm -hmm. And language is so incredibly important because you have college coaches who by the same definition are quit on their teams all the time Mm -hmm. for, bigger paychecks at other universities and it's seen as moving up the coaching ladder. It's not seen as quitting. And so the language around quitting, that's what the student athletes were talking to me about was trying to reframe that language. And it's difficult because it's, it's, you don't want to rob words of their meaning, but in sports, quitting was the word for everything, whether it was moving on, moving up, moving over, Stepping right. aside, stepping back, like mm-hmm. those are completely different things than quitting. Mm-hmm. But in sports, it's all quitting, you know. Yeah. yeah. And there's no room for, there's no room for it to be anything else. And so that I definitely still, even though I'd written the book about Maddie going into, going into my dad's ALS, I definitely still or leaving ESPN, I definitely still thought I'm quitting quote unquote ESPN. And if I quit ESPN, that's my decision, but I have to, I have to accept that like, I'll be a quitter then. And on the backside of leaving ESPN, I'll be, you know, I will be a less strong version of myself. These, these are things that I still thought. Mm -hmm. And I, and I also, when my dad was first diagnosed before we kind of got into the beast of the disease, I also thought that he had to, he could never quit, right? He had to fight. Exactly. Yes. So 
all of that kind of started to come to a head when you actually see what his disease was with ALS, where none of the none of the lessons you're learned in sports that you apply to sports that make you better could work in this scenario. Right. There was yeah. none, none of them were applicable. And you know, this with your dad. And so how could none of the lessons that I've learned and like the ways to improve myself, none of those are applicable. So what is applicable is, is quitting yeah. still the right framework to apply right. to ALS when Hard work isn't a framework that's applicable. So right, if hard right. work's not applicable and dedication's not applicable, like then I need to reframe the backside yeah. of it as well. And yeah, so it's like, where, where that's do we go where from there? surrender. Yeah. Um, so that's where surrender really came in. And I started to, in the latter stages of his disease, started to realize like the strength and the grace in in surrender and, and sure as applied to my dad, but also like you mentioned, like Simone Biles, like, yeah, there's a beauty in her surrendering in that moment to what her body and her mind is telling her. Like there's, right. a, there's, a, there's its own beauty in that, that I don't think sports allows enough space for. Yeah. Well, I hope it continues to like be, um, you know, obviously that, that athletes stay healthy in the respect that they need, but that when people need to surrender to what their body's telling them that they listen. And I think, one of the things I, I agree with everything you said around the quitting being like the predominant word in sports. And it's like, I remember feeling like, um, you know, obviously there's just like a lot of shame around quitting. And then that carried over into like my work life relationships, like everything. And mm -hmm. I, what I learned is that quitting is disassociating from my body. Like quitting is completely like that idea of like, I have to stay with it or like stick it out is complete disassociation. And as an athlete, yeah. people don't recognize this, especially enough for women, but we were, we were, and even in business, like work long hours, like more is better, all that, all that bullshit, basically. Um, we were like mm -hmm. rewarded. We were rewarded for disassociating from pain, from like, you know, mental, physical health issues. Uh, we were called leaders. Yeah. We were given scholarships. And I think, I'm sort of in this space too of like, you know, um, I'm no longer willing to disassociate from this. Like this thing is like pretty intelligent. So like, if it tells me something, I have to listen. And that's, that's sort of like its own conversation, but I'm wondering if you have any thoughts or ideas around this idea of disassociating from the body in order to, to please the masses. Yeah. I, I think even just, as I mentioned earlier, like I've, I've spent a good amount of time with like the Las Vegas aces in the last couple months and they're a WNBA team and it's been really cool s seeing them break the framework of we're a team and everything's uniform mm. because I think that there's great value in that. We love being a part of a team and there's so much within it that uh, challenging yourself to bend to the rules of the team. There's like, there's growth in that. But I also think that it's a flawed model that, what works for one person within a team, whether it's workouts, sleep patterns, eating patterns, what mm -hmm. works for one person doesn't work for everyone. And so mm -hmm. if you've got a regimented team model where it's like, we all have breakfast at 9 a.m., we all work out at noon and it's this pace, well, it's like not everybody works that way. Right. And it's been really, and, and that's, it, it, and the reason I'm bringing it up in response to your question is because I think that in a team, when I was growing up, what I was taught was that if my body's pushing back or my mind's pushing back about this structure, then I need to ignore it and force myself into the structure, mm -hmm. which, which I think it's like poetry or writing. It's like once you've mastered, there's a time and place to do that so that you know you're capable when you're younger, you know, it's not just yeah. like, oh yeah, everybody's an individual and let's make new rules for everybody. But sure. when you get to certain levels, especially something like the WNBA and, and where people have become masters of these things, then you don't want them to disassociate from their body. You, you want to know that this player wants is better to eat at this time. And this player needs more sleep. And it, so like, let's build a structure where we're okay. If so-and-so misses, shoot around every once in a while because they need more sleep. And like the, and those things end up with like a, a better overall team where people feel like they're more connected to who they are within the framework of a team. And 
byproduct being that you're usually better at the thing you want to be better at as well. Yeah. I mean, I think coaches and leaders are understanding that we're not robots and we have to like be individuals to yeah. add our, add our genius to the team. I actually was thinking a little bit, as you said that about, do you remember when Dennis Robin like went AWOL in the finals and he went to Vegas like overnight cause he just needed to get some energy out and how Phil Jackson like yep. had the intelligence yep. to like let him do that. And I thought that was kind of, kind of mm-hmm. cool that back then he had that. So and ahead of its time. Yeah. Yeah. And Michael Jordan was like, cool, you can go to Vegas, just come back and get like 30 rebounds. It'll work out. Um, yeah, we, and to that, to that point quickly, um, Mm -hmm. because we're talking about quitting and Simone Biles, Mm -hmm. like do the way the language you, we used around Michael Jordan taking a year off to go play baseball and Mm -hmm. try his hand at another sport. No one used the language of Michael Jordan quit. Like, I mean, yeah. quitting in sports is not like Simone Biles didn't like introduce yeah. this idea. Like, it's just we just reframe it depending on like the person, the player, the time. But like, no one talked about Michael Jordan. Like, he quit on the Bulls. If you're going to yeah. use that aggressive language, yeah. the way people have been applying it to Simone Biles, but instead it was like it was reframed differently because he's Michael Jordan, but yeah. his, his dad had just died and he just won three titles. And like his body wasn't in line with, I'm assuming, right. With the pursuit of continuing for a fourth championship, like he needed something different. Like these are all understandable right. things. And, but in retrospect, we don't think of it like, Oh, Michael Jordan quit yeah, because these examples have existed throughout history. But we just like in the moment we have like some sort of, you know, like, modern proximity infatuation with like being as outrageous as possible. Yeah. And men, men, get, men generally get more leeway and they get to kind of take a break or take yes, a year. Yes. And then women are like total mm-hmm. hot, hot messes when we, uh, step away. Um, <laughs> that's actually, right, I, rem- that's right. I remember when I was like, uh, I don't know, I was like 24, I was going through something really difficult. And one of my therapists, I was getting a master's degree upstate at some small, tiny college. And I really didn't want to stay. I wanted to go home for various reasons. And she looked at me and she was like this old, like earthy, crunchy, adorable, like shaman of a therapist. And she looked at me and she's like, maybe staying is quitting. And I was like, skirt like I had no like didn't even my life cross my mind and it was it was grace she was asking me to have grace with myself and to listen to what I need versus this get a free master's and coach and blah 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 and that has mm-hmm. stayed with me and and sometimes I, I still stay in jobs and relationships too long because I'm just still conditioned to just stay and stay and grin and bear it and fix and fix and and then, and then lately I'm just like, bye, I got, I got to go. Um, yeah. <laughs> so brings me to your question or to, to you. I want to know what your relationship is to surrendering and your relationship is to kind of listening to your body and making decisions that serve you. I'm much better about listening to my body when it comes to my older self and my older pursuit of quote unquote, staying in shape. Mm -hmm. and working out like I'm it's much easier for me to now in the last few years I'm trying to uh, apply that practice of like saying no actually doing the workout is quitting in some ways because I've Mm -hmm. uh, like Mm -hmm. your you know your teacher had said like in some ways it's giving up on your mind and your body in in pursuit of some societal um you know, societal standard. So I am better about that these days, but I still, I am still completely conditioned to be fearful that if I leave things or, or I decide they're not for me, that it like will become a habit. I think that's something that I was taught at least through basketball. And maybe a lot of kids are taught like, you know, quitting becomes a habit and, mm. mm-hmm. or, or what I, I'm using quitting because I don't think we have an all encompassing word in sports yeah. as, as, as effective as quitting. I still like, I still am so paranoid of that, that it's almost like, an. Uh, my mom once told me that her dad was an alcoholic. And so like, if I have alcohol more than two to three nights in a row, I have to not drink for a week because I just like internally yeah. I have this mindset that like I have to I have to prove to myself that I cannot do it. Mm-hmm. And so if I 
flake out on a friend for dinner or like I leave a contract or a job or an obligation, I have to like not do it for a set amount of time to like ward off the possibility that it will become an ingrained habit that like defines Mm. me. Yeah. So. Yeah. You know what it feels like? It feels like there's like two, there's like one identity, the one that we were given, the one that we said yes to, but we unconsciously said yes to with like, you know, staying with it, grinning and bearing it, like getting shit done, productivity, blah, blah, blah. And then like we hit some walls and then we're like, that sucked and that doesn't work for me. So I'm going to like try dabbling with a no, Mm -hmm. or I'm going to try dabbling with less is more. And I feel like it's like these two identities that are constantly some, sometimes at war with each other. Other times they're like talking nicely to each other. Like, no, it's cool. Like you're not going to develop an issue if you have, for me, it's chocolate. I'm like, cool. I'll just eat like four Mm -hmm. bars of chocolate in a week. And then, (laughs) and then I'm like, what's wrong with you? There's a lot of judgment. I'm like, oh, I can't become that person. So I don't know that makes sense to you, but that's how my brain was thinking about that. It's like, there are these two worlds, you know? Mm -hmm. But I think not, but, but it kind of goes back to, I offhand mentioned earlier that like, I was a fat little kid. I don't even know. I was a chubby kid. Um, and I can't, it feels almost impossible to uncondition myself from that. I think that maybe, maybe I'm hypothesizing on the fly here that because we learn this conditioning from like age, whatever we can remember, age five to 21, that that is so deep and so embedded. And because so much of you, like I still respond better to music from when Mm -hmm. I was 12 to 20 than any other period. I think, Mm -hmm you of course can make headway to reshape some of these things, but it sometimes feels like that's the, mo- the monster within is like the, you have to work out every day. You have to like, you know, like you can't ever quit. Like it feels yeah. like that is the bigger thing inside of me and the actual life lessons and like treat yourself well. And all of that feels like I'm, tr- I'm trying to believe in it and holding down like the inner conditioning. Yeah. Yeah. That makes sense. I mean, I think that's, that's literally like adulting and becoming like year by year, you kind of lean into that or you don't. Um, mm-hmm. I have so many questions left for you. I know we have some, some only a few minutes left. Um, I'm just curious about, you mentioned earlier in the call, like just navigating the world of social media. Sometimes you take months off. Um, just curious about your relationship to social media, uh, in terms of like external validation, productivity, but yet also it's a vehicle for your stories and the work that you do so well. So yeah. just curious about your relationship to it. I, I don't think, and I, and I haven't interrogated this, but I don't think that I get a lot of validation, like self validation from social media. Like I'm not, I'm not on it to grow my followers. I don't have a lot of attachment to how many likes something gets. I find it more problematic for me in that back to the drinking thing, I guess I have it in my head. I have some level of addictive behavior. And so Mm. I find myself, even now Instagram's deleted off my phone. I had to, in fact, I had to text you on Instagram through my wife's phone, log in through her phone to like hit you up, but that's neither nor there for your listeners. But, um, I find it more to be like a reflex thing that I do where it's like, Oh, I'm going to check my email and then I'm down Instagram. So it's like this addictive behavior, less validating. It's not validating. I don't, I don't think I get a lot of like ego from it. Um, so that's why I delete it and I would delete it permanently. I would cancel all my accounts if I didn't have that voice in my head telling me, well, then how would anyone know if you put out another book? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. How would anyone know if you wrote an article? Yeah. I don't even think that's true. I think people it's find not, yeah. books they would, through they would other find ways. You. Yeah. Yeah. But I still think that's true. And people still tell you it's true. Yeah, for sure. Have you heard so, of the work of uh, Cal Newport? Up. Yes, I read Deep Work. Yeah, he's cool. I his like book, him. Deep Work. Yeah, he's awesome. Yeah. All right. Last two questions. What are you actively unlearning? We've kind of talked a little bit about it, but what are you actively unlearning mm-hmm. in this chapter of your life? You'll have to edit out my silence here for a minute as I think about that. Um, what am I unlearning? Hmm. 
Um, I would say you're really gonna have to edit out my silence now. Um, no, it's it's good. People can learn to sit with silence. Oh, okay, it's good. People love it. They can. <laughs> right there we go. Wow, that's actually okay. So that's actually part of what I'm trying to unlearn. Um, or I don't if it's unlearn or or do work around is most of the time when I meet new people or have conversations, I, I can't allow a lot of silence. It makes me very panicky Mm -hmm. and I, I do too much psychoanalyzing about how conversations went. Um, and it ends up having the effect that like, if I go out to dinner with someone new one, I'm really curious about them. And I also have a background of being a journalist. So like asking questions isn't unusual for me, (laughs) but I'm trying to do less of that because I think it can feel very aggressive to someone. If at dinner you're like peppering them with questions, like it's an interrogation. Mm -hmm. And then when we have people over to our house or if we have a party, I have so much anxiety that I'm not even paying attention. I'm not even present at the party. I'm just like, I'm just really stressed about whether people are having a good time. So I'm trying Mm -hmm. to be better about that in my life, about allowing, allowing silence and allowing other people to have some level of control and social interactions. Um, even though I will say in defense of myself that people aren't as good at asking questions of other people as they probably mm. could be. That's true. Um, That's true. I find that, I find that shocking in yeah. some levels. Like yeah. sometimes I think to myself when I'm out to dinner, if I wasn't asking questions, would we just sit here in silence? Um, you would repeat the but, same like four conversations and likely it would be about gossip or something. Yes. Yeah, probably. Right. Oh, coronavirus mm. probably. Yeah. Yeah, yeah I'd, I'd opt. I would opt out of that conversation real quick. Um, well, yeah. that's why this is yeah. questions is your profession. So keep leading the way, please. Um, however subtle you <laughs> wish to do. Um, my last question to you um, is: How would you define unlearning if you were to define it? Wow, these are not softball questions. I mean, look, you said people are bad at asking questions, <laughs> so I'm trying to let you know that some people can. They are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Some people are good at it, like you. Um, I don't know. Is it because it's not so much unlearning? I guess for me, my experience with it isn't so much unlearning as because unlearning implies that to some. So I'm I'm thinking of the the conversation we were just having about like my dad ALS that like hard work and dedication weren't. Mm -hmm. weren't tools that could be applied to ALS. Therefore, I wasn't trying to unlearn that. I just was re like, I was reframing it. Yeah. You were pivoting. Yes. uh, You know? Yeah. So I guess that's more so how I I would, that's how I would describe unlearning is like, if you think of it as like completely eradicating yourself of that belief system, that's a tall task as well. Uh, Mm. more pivoting it even if you can pivot it a a degree or two that's a good start and I think that's how I I don't think I'd do that but I think that would be helpful if I didn't think of it as like a zero to a hundred or needing like a a hundred percent success rate as in just like small movements yeah yeah well small is big and I think that it speaks to like the the power of nuance right like you you don't get rid of some conditioning. You just learn to like work with it better and think about it better. Um, yep. Okay, cool. I know uh, you have a busy schedule. So thank you for coming on uh, my podcast and yes. talking shop with me about basketball, all the things. Um, <laughs> and it. thank you. Hey friends. Thanks for listening to the school of unlearning podcast. You can follow us on Spotify and iTunes. Be sure to check out the show notes complete with links and insight. You won't want to miss. If you enjoyed this episode, take one minute to rate, review, and share this podcast because our learning and unlearning never ends and we don't have to do it alone.